Hello. Today is March 12, 2011. We're meeting today with Dr. Robert Creer at his home in Estes Park, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Bob, and thanks for sitting down today to tell your story. Thank you very much. Let's start out, if we could, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. I was born in western Pennsylvania, city of Pittsburgh, and grew up about 15 miles outside of there in the semi-rural area, which is nice for me because I became pretty much an outdoorsman. There were open fields there and a nice forest to run around in, and the Allegheny River not too far away. So. Ooh. So that was the beginning of my outdoor career, you might say. What's your, what's your date of birth? Uh, date of birth is April 13, 1922. And uh, brothers, sisters? I had a brother, uh, three years older than I. And I lost him in World War II. Okay. One thing, uh, so uh, you grew up there in western Pennsylvania, uh, went through the, what, what uh, was it in a, a town, or were you guys out in the country, or...? It was a little suburb known as Rosedale, outside of Pittsburgh. Rosedale, yeah, there wasn't nothing there except the residences, you might say. So. Sounds like it was idiyllic for a little kid, uh, a little boy. Yeah, to... He was very glad to get out of the city. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you went through the, the school system there? Went through uh... the elementary school system there, first year of high school. Okay. And for my second and third year of high school, we moved into the city again. And by my junior senior year, and Sophomore, junior years, then my, for my senior year, I moved way up into the country, northwestern Pennsylvania, to a town of Emlinton, where I put in my senior year. So, so I've done three high schools. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, one thing I always like to, to ask uh, people of your generation before we get into your war experience uh, was the Great Depression. Was your, do you have many memories of that? Was your family affected by that at all? Oh, yes, they're very much affected by it. Uh, my dad... Uh, Became ill, I should say, and he, he lost his business, and uh, that's the reason we had to move back into the city, I guess. And uh, I remember my mother had to work pretty hard to keep. She said to keep my brother and I from feeling any insecurity, which was wonderful. Mm. Was a wonderful woman. Wow. But uh, uh, they got us back into the city for a couple of years, and then and back up in the country of northwestern Pennsylvania, to where my dad has spent a lot of time in his youth. And he had relatives there, so we moved up there. So it sounds like uh, your see, mom tried to shelter you as much as she could from the Depression, so... She really did, yes. It really yeah. didn't affect yeah. you, as you know it, as, from your memories, but obviously it had a, a big effect on the family. Yes, yeah. a big effect, yeah. Wow. So what year then did you graduate from high school? 1940. 1940? Yeah. And uh, take us from there. Did you, uh, what did you do after graduating? I worked a bit up there in Pennsylvania gas fields, in the woods, cutting timber and that sort of thing. Worked in the Quaker State Refinery. This little town of Emmelton was the home refinery for Quaker State, so I worked for them. Then in 1941, 42, I guess it was, I entered Penn State University. I went to the Forest Ranger. So that was the uh, entrance into the 10th Mountain Division, actually. Was, the Penn State Forestry School was separate from the main campus at Penn State. It was down in the southern Appalachian part of Pennsylvania. And they closed that campus after my first semester because of, they were losing so many male students on the main, main campus, they couldn't afford to keep open two campuses. So they closed that down and moved us all up to the main campus at Penn State. And I was on the Penn State ski team there. And the Penn State coach told us about the 10th Mountain Division, informed out in Colorado. And uh, as Harold probably told you, we had to send like, three letters of recommendation to get into this infantry division, which is incredible. Right, right. Very elite uh, program. Very elite program, yeah. yes. And so I, I was accepted because of my outdoor experience. And, and I was a very physically fit person. And I was actually six inches, Six inches taller than I am now, if you can believe it. Is that right? I lost six inches because of my back problems, yeah. Oh, boy. And I was a very powerful man, too. I was a gymnast. And, so. well, well, backing up for a moment, <clears throat> uh, do you remember when you first heard about Pearl Harbor and what you were thinking? Uh, yes, I remember me in high school at the time that happened. and We were astounded that the Japanese would presume to have 
to attack our country, of course. So, so like high school kids, we, we thought we might be in the army sometime, wondered what we wanted to be. At that time, I wanted to be uh, a fighter pilot in, in, in the Air Force. I guess I never heard of the 10th Mountain Division yet. But because uh, my brother was in the service by then, he was a bombardier, navigator, and a oh, boy. B-24 Liberator. Oh. But when I got yeah, I got to Penn State, then I learned about the 10th Mountain Division. I was a skier and outdoorsman. So. so how long were you just there uh, at Penn State before you? Uh, as a Penn State, the main campus, in one one semester. One only, semester? The spring semester. And then? And I was inducted in, in the spring. And, and then how, how soon after that did you ship off to uh, to Colorado or for uh, to tr- the tr- School was over in May, so I went home for about a couple of weeks, I guess, and induction came right after that. It took me just, Sent me to Fort Meade, Maryland for my induction. I thought I was going straight to the 10th Mountain Division, but they, they took one look at my physique and said, make a good uh, military policeman. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so they shut me up to the mil- mil- ter- military police replacement training center in Fort, uh, in the Battle of the Commission, I think it was, you know, someplace there. And I was there two or three weeks, I guess, and I, in judo training one day, I injured my, my left knee, a cartilage, and they wouldn't repair it. They said, well, no, we're going to discharge you from the Army and send you home, and your, your hospital nurse, your home, will take care of that. So I said to myself, no way, you're going to do that. <laughs> I had that little card that the, maybe Harold told you about that. The, the National Ski Patrol System was recruiting for the U.S. Army for the 10th Mountain Division. And because of my three letters of recommendation, they sent me this card that I, I should submit to the Adjutant General's office upon induction. I would send that in a motion and I'd be sent immediately to the 10th Mountain Division. For some reason, I decided to stay with the military police for, for my training. They said, you get much better basic training here than you'll get in the Army. So that appealed to me for some reason. I wasn't thinking very well. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, but then when this, this thing happened with my left knee, my, I didn't want to be kicked out of the Army, so I sent the card in. Within a week, I had my orders, shipping me off to Camp Hale. Well, now, that, how, how did that, uh, let's talk a little bit about your, your injury. Did, how did that affect affect you coming to the 10th Mountain? I mean, did you recover from that? Did you get treatment I, for it? I or? didn't know if they'd keep me there or not, but I was able to talk to them to send me to the camp hospital. They, they operated on it, and you got well. And, I was great from that on. So wow. it was a good gamble on my part. Wow, yeah. yeah. Boy, another testimony to your being physically fit to, to yes. recover from something yeah. like that. Yeah. How was that transition going from civilian life into military life for you? That was kind of exciting. We all wanted to be in the Army at that time, of course. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, I definitely didn't want the military police. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was not my style at all. <laughs> But uh, sooner or later, I have transferred out of that. And at that time, the, who was it? General Marshall, who was the head of the military at that time, said that the 10th Mountain Division had priority over any other division in the United States for recruiting. Anybody in any other division could transfer if they wanted to. Wow. Wanted to because it was, it was a tough priority. Oh, wow. Now, how soon then after you got your letter back with your transfer orders, did, did you ship out west then? That ship had a four, after, you, after you got your orders that, that you were in the tent, how yeah. soon then thereafter did you you come west? Just, just a couple of days. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Since I get me to a train, yeah. Had, <laughs> had you ever been out west before? Never been out west before. Yeah. I was excited. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. The train approached Colorado. I was like, look at those mountains. And yeah, right. When I saw them, I was thrilled because oh, wow. they were snow covered and I'd be up there someplace. And then I took the train from Denver and it got me up to Leadville and I'm on the Camp Hill. Yeah. Well, talk a little bit about uh, the training there at, at Camp Hale and, and some of the things that you guys went through and as you, as the... Oh, the training. <clears throat> the training was fantastic. Extremely rough. Extremely rough, yeah. We were, the, the camp was located at 9,300 feet to begin with. Now, did you have any problem coming from a lower elevation? In? Only a little bit because I was, I was an athlete at that time. And athletes had very little problem. In about a month, they were in good shape. But it was a young man's outfit, there was no doubt about that. Men over 30 had a tough time adjusting to that altitude because we trained clear up to 14,000. But uh, it didn't take me long, and I was ready for it. Well, 
we trained in the Jack in there, in, I think in June, or early, early summer of 1943. And of course, I went there. I went to the hospital first. I didn't get back into the campaign until until September. Uh, they sent me home for a, a month recovery after the operation. But then we were out in the forest all the time, up in the mountains, and, and it wasn't long before the snow came, and that's when the real tough training came, because we carried very heavy packs, I hope I told you, but about 90 pounds, I estimated, sometimes well over 100. And then we were on snowshoes or skis, skiing with a weight like that on your back. We developed a very powerful legs. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet. Yeah. yeah. And uh, when we entered combat, we were probably the most physically fit infantry division in Italy, I'm sure. And all the generals who would see that, even the Germans saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were anticipating our arrival because they knew about all our training. <laughs> Wasn't any secret about the 10th Mountain Division. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, now, how did, how did you find the difference between uh, the skiing between East Coast and, and Colorado mountain skiing? Was there was that much of an adjustment <clears throat> for you? Not too much. Uh, it's just a matter of getting used to those long skis <laughs> and very heavy skis. And, um, <clears throat> I was mainly a cross country skier. I wasn't a downhill skier. Oh, okay, but, okay, gotcha. So, so, so I was used to that. Okay. Now, did oh, in in part of your training up at, at Camp Hale, did you have any sort of specialty, or was it just general training? Did they specialize guys or cross train guys? <clears throat> how did how did at that? First, work? they put me into a weapons platoon, which meant that I was I was in the machine gun and mortar platoon. This didn't appeal to me too much, but I got up to be a sergeant for that, and then the, for some reason I disappointed and antagonized one of my officers, and I got busted. <laughs> so and I was rather glad of that, because that gave me the opportunity to transfer from that platoon to a, to a rifle platoon when I was back on skis. So I was very happy about that. And eventually I became a platoon sergeant in kind of combat, so. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, what about uh, some of the other... Uh, uh, our, our main training was Mountain warfare, winter survival, under, under all conditions. So we were trained in rock climbing and skiing and all aspects of mountaineering. We were true alpine troops. Wow. And uh, there was one, uh, we, Easter Sunday, 1944, I remember we, we slipped out in the snow at uh, 40 degrees below zero, if you can imagine that. Wow. And that, was, that was part of a six weeks training out in the snow all, all the time. And then they went back to the barracks. And we were trained to be very tough, and there wasn't any doubt about it. And, oh. and, uh, but we never had to use that in combat, because we trained in the Apennines and the Alps was very mild compared to the Colorado Rockies. <laughs> well, I'm assuming you, you probably never knew your orders till you got there, but I, mean, I assumed everybody thought, well, we'll eventually be fighting in the Alps, was the, the ultimate goal. I, we didn't know what was going to happen. We were, we were very much overtrained. That the 10th Mountain Division began in 1941. I earned it in '43, and there no nobody wanted us. General Eisenhower turned us down. At least his staff did. He didn't know about this, I guess. But we learned after the war. Nobody wanted this because of the logistics involved. We had three thousand mules, and no, <laughs> no divisional commander wanted one to deal with three thousand mules and all the logistics involved <laughs> involved there. But we were shipped from. Camp Hale in the summer of 1944, down to Camp Swift, Texas. We didn't know why at the time. It stunned us all. And But we learned after the war they intended, they didn't need an arm and military Alpine division. They wanted to reconvert us into a flatland division. Oh, jeez. And that just destroyed the morale of all of our guys. We didn't know it at that time, of course. But then in the fall that year, we got a new commander. General George Hayes, who was a second in command of the Second Division in, in the invasion of Normandy, I guess. And General Marshall wanted him to have a division of his own, so he brought him over here and gave him the 10th Mountain Division. And Hayes immediately saw we were something special, so he officially classified us as, as the 10th Mountain Division. And at that time, we'd just been 10th Division of Light, something like that. So, 
Then he got orders of what to do with us. He didn't tell us. Then we shipped us all to Newport News, Virginia, where we, where we got to ship out. So we saw we were going to Europe at least. Thank heavens, not the South Pacific. <laughs> yeah, right. And then as soon as the ship was out to sea, he told us, you're going to be fighting in Italy, you're going to be fighting as mountain troops. General Clark wanted you very badly there, so... Now, we were all very happy about uh, that. Oh, I'm sure. Now, how was that, uh, after spending all that time in the mountains, it must have been a, a shock to be training down in, uh, I'm assuming uh, hot down uh, in Texas. And... It was terrible. We just finished our, our, our spring skiing up there at Camp Hill. And we went down to Texas, 110 degrees. Oh. And some of our men dropped like flies for a while. But fortunately, we were very fit, so we were able to adjust to that too. Yeah. But we hated Texas. I think. Yeah. Even though some of us, like myself, are a very attractive co at the University of Texas. <laughs> we get it. <laughs> so then on your way then to, before you guys uh, shipped out to um, to Europe, being that close to home, did you get a chance to uh, furlough or anything to get home to see your mom before no, you? No, no, no furloughs. No furloughs were permitted. We weren't allowed in the right. Oh, is that right? We weren't able to tell anybody where we were going or anything or when we were going. So it's top secret, of course, when we shipped out. Okay, so you guys uh, disembark or take off uh, from uh, for the for Europe. How was that for a, a boy from Pennsylvania that's been spent all this time up in the mountains, being at sea? Did you get your sea legs? How was that that crossing? I had never got my sea legs. It was thirteen days, I believe, and I was sick every day. <laughs> it's kind of a joke to the others in the company because I was considered one of the one of the strongest men in the company. There I was puking over the side of the boat oh. all the time. <laughs> Not eating much. <laughs> oh, my. It, it was a rough voyage across. Yeah. Did you guys go, uh, were you solo or were you in a, in a, a convoy? We, we, or? We were in a convoy. Any... We, didn't, we didn't see many of the other ships. There were quite a few, I guess. At that time, there wasn't much of a uh, submarine problem. Oh, there wasn't? Okay, that was my next but, question, uh, if you had yeah, been in yeah. any worries of a sub attack. Us, yeah. Okay. So you learned at sea that you guys were going to Italy. Uh -huh. uh, and then where'd you guys uh, where'd you guys land then? We landed at Naples. Um, we were delighted, delighted to get in the Mediterranean because it was a nice, calm, blue, and <laughs> nice. <laughs> and yeah, we landed in Naples, went past Capri, and I mean, this was our first shock of the war to see what had happened in Naples during the war because I think both the Germans and the Americans had bombed Naples, and the ship harbor was full of sunken ships and so forth. So. We came over to him and docked and wow. got off and a big crowd of Italians watching us and I assumed there were also Germans there too. <laughs> that was true, that they knew exactly when we arrived. So we stayed there for a while, but maybe two or three days and then the Germans made a breakthrough further north against our 92nd Division, which was a Negro, the all Negro Division. And uh, we didn't know how bad that was. so. They cut short our, our stay in Naples and shipped us north immediately by boat to Leghorn, which is near, near Pisa. And we got off there, and by that time the Germans hadn't, hadn't stopped. and So we stopped there around at Lightning Tower of Pisa to do some more training, about mines and that sort of thing. And we were there maybe a couple of weeks before they shipped us up into the Appenine Mountains. And okay. The little town of San Marcello first. And we stayed there a couple of weeks, and then finally we shipped up into the line, uh, just under the mountain of Mount Belvedere, which was the big part of our attack. And, and we got there in January, about January, February, I guess. Yeah, it's a lot of patrolling, and nothing major going on. It seemed like neither the Germans nor the Americans won get many battles during that part of the winter, so it's kind of an unofficial truce. They would occasionally throw some shells at us, we would show them back. And, <laughs> and it wasn't until about, well, we had a couple of patrols. I remember one patrol in snowshoes. And uh, it, it made an awful lot of noise that bothered me. We didn't use our skis in combat at all. Oh, is that right? There was only one patrol by some of our experts. And, and uh, the skis weren't very practical. <laughs> you can get. Fall down, creep and crawl with snowshoes on your on your feet. You can't do it with skis on your feet, so <laughs> snowshoes are more practical. Yeah. How was the winter that, that winter? Winter was well, mild compared to what we were used to. Oh, okay. Extremely mild, yeah. And it was beginning to end, too, so. 
But on February 18th, I believe it was, we, we, the major attack we began. The Germans were expecting it. When we arrived in combat over there, the Germans sent us a lot of propaganda leaflets about him. We weren't going to find it very nice there, not compared to the Camp Swift or Camp Hale, but the, you come to, to Italy to die. <laughs> How did that play on your mind? Did that play on your mind at all? I mean, I that they mean, knew all that? It, it, amused, it amused us. Oh, is that right? <laughs> but at the, the same time, they told their own troops, they especially alert, the 10th Mountain Division has arrived, and that is a crack outfit. So they, they knew what we were. But uh, and it was, there was a I mentioned Mount Belvedere. Ralph left the Mount Belvedere. There was a, a big mountain ridge of consisting of four mountains called River Ridge. And the, our General Hayes was smart enough to know that that was the key to taking Belvedere and all the other mountains. Because prior to our arrival, three mountain divisions had tried to take Mount Belvedere. One of them succeeded. Once they got on top, they were just destroyed by artillery fire coming from they were observers of Reaver Ridge. So he said, we got to take Reaver Ridge first. And that was done in a very fascinating manner. Uh, we had some of the best, mountain, the best mountaineers in the United States, the American Alpine troops, and, and, and not, not Alpine troops. Uh, they pioneered four routes up, up that ridge. And one route below each one of those mountains on that on Rio Ridge. And February 18th, I believe it was, at about seven o'clock at night, it, it, it was dark. We started up the ridge, and on those four routes, about 100 men to each, 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 each route, I believe. We were on top, uh, not me, I, I was waiting at the bottom of the building here. And by six o'clock in the morning, they were on top. The Germans were asleep in their bunkers. <laughs> they told us afterwards, we knew Americans could not climb that. It was pretty steep. And the, some places covered with ice and snow. We were climbing on the fixed ropes. And this was, it surprised them. But even if we hadn't surprised them, I think we would still have taken them. But, uh, they counterattacked for three or four days, but then they finally gave up. Uh, I might say at this point that and our whole combat over there, never did one German counterattack ever succeed. Everyone was destroyed. So wow. They finally gave up trying to counterattack this one. Well, so, so we had River Ridge, and as soon as we heard that, we lot of us waiting at the bottom of Mount Belvedere heard that River Ridge was taken, then we started. And the same thing, we started about 11, 11 o'clock at night and, and just started walking up quietly. Our general knew if, we, if there had been a prior artillery, uh, preparation, it would have alerted the Germans and they'd been waiting for us. So we were pretty well up the mountain before they discovered us. And then, of course, all hell broke loose. <laughs> wow. um, we were on top at six again. And uh, it was Mount, Mount Belvedere and then the Mount did Mount Gorgolesco and one of the third one, I guess. And we lost a lot of men, no doubt about it. A lot of men. But uh, we, we took. The, and that broke through what was the Germans called their Gothic, the Gothic line. It was the, the last line of defense they had against letting us get into the Po Valley and north into the Alps. And so they were really, really, really shocked. How did how did your company fare during uh, during this this battle? And they were part of my division. Well, all of my my, my regiment. Yeah, which were you 85th or 86th? Which, I was in the 86th. Yeah. 86th, okay. It, it was the 86th Regiment that attacked Reaver Ridge and took that. Yeah. Oh, okay. But, uh, several units within that, except for my unit. Uh, my and Harold. Harold and I were in the same platoon. He had a oh, okay. Unit. Yeah. Harold Hagen. So, um, we took Milvedere, Mount Gorgolesco, and one other mountain beyond that. An attempt was made to take Mount Dolotraccia. By the 85th Regiment, and uh, by that time it, it, they were pretty much out of ammunition, and uh, artillery preparation was poor, so their attack didn't didn't work. So uh, a day or two later, when well, again my company and my battalion, uh, the 86th, was assigned, uh, and we we took Mount Dolotraccia. And those were the major divisions, uh, the major German mountains, in the Gothic line. 
have a permit to take this Highway 64, I believe it was, north into the Po Valley. So the Germans knew they were in real trouble. They tried a, a, a counterattack on the Mount, Mount de la Trecia. After about a one hour artillery preparation, I guess, and we were all co cowering down in our holes. Uh, uh, yeah, can you describe uh, what a, a, a barrage is like? I mean, for well, and, and what it's like to be in uh, for people like me that has no idea what it's like to be in battle, and what what what's goes what goes through your mind is uh, possibly have any idea what it's like in a sure in right, right yeah. yeah. At that time, I was uh, the, the, the commander sent me down the bottom of the mountain to. to Guard against an attack from the Germans up another valley. So about, uh, about six of us went down there. And we were just dug in our, our, our foxholes, long poles, so we could lie in facing this valley. Just in the chance the Germans might come up that way. And about that time, the artillery preparation came in, and we were right in the impact area. They were told that, that lasted about an hour. I, I must have gone in the partial shock because we were. <laughs> that, that, the shrapnel was barely missing, as you might say. And when the artillery preparation arrived, they had Germans had sent up a, a reinforced mountain battalion up in the other valley. They tried to faint from the other direction. That didn't work. But our, our battalion commander was very sharp. He had, he had that, that, that route. They came up fully prepared with artillery and mortars and so forth, machine guns. So literally, they wiped them out. Except for 50, only 50 of their men survived and they surrendered. Hmm. But the, being in a, an artillery attack is, is just hard to explain. You know, your senses just become dulled. You're stunned. <laughs> I guess you're praying. I'm sure we we're all praying. <laughs> but uh, and you just wait and hope. <laughs> hmm. uh, I'd been pulled out of my foxhole at the top of Mount Del Terrace, and when I went back up there, I found that the man they'd brought up to put, put in my hole had sustained a severe injury and bordered the land that was in the side of his hole. Had I been in that hole, that would have been me. Right, right. Yeah. Wow. So that's the sort of luck I had all through combat. Yeah. Hmm. But we were on top of Del Terrace for maybe a week or something like that. Well, they reinforced us. We'd lost a lot of men by then. So they brought in replacements. And unfortunately, the replacements we got were not mountain trained men. The military never believed, the Pentagon never believed in the 10th Mountain Division. Only General Marshall did. They should have been re 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 training men of our type to replace us, but they never did. So once you guys left Camp Hale, I mean, you all left, there was nobody that backfilled and nobody trained. Back really? In fact, they tore down Camp Hale soon after that. Huh. We didn't learn that till we got home, till we got back in this country. Huh. No, the, the Pentagon didn't support us much. I mean, we never, we never forgave him for that. <laughs> huh. but, uh, but General Marshall did. He was a smart man. So then after that, the, our major attack began. We were determined to get the Germans off the mountain, off the Apennine Mountains entirely. And I forget the exact dates, of course, when we actually broke through to the Po Valley, but, but we did. We, we tended to lose men, of course. But, uh, then once we got to the Po Valley, why, well, gosh, the Germans were on a route then. They knew they had to get out of that. They really wanted to save the, uh, preserve the Po Valley, because that was a breadbasket for all their troops in, in, in Europe, as well as for Italy. So when they lost that, uh, they lost the war in Italy. So our division was way out in front of all the others. We were the first into the Po Valley. And we, we, our division, divisional commander said, he, he's not going to stop. The, 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 the higher generals wanted them to stop. He, he said, no, I'm going to leave, continue to spearhead the 5th Army. And he did. The Germans were fleeing before us, and we got to the Po River, which was a major obstacle. He never waited there. He pulled up some boats we could row across the river. So we were the first to cross the Po. <laughs> And then after that, I, we liberated the city of Verona. I went on to, we were detailed over into Lake Garda, one of the beautiful Finger Lakes at, at the base of the Alps there. Mussolini had a villa there. Well, he heard we were coming and he got out of there, but the partisans got him soon after that and killed him, so we chased him out. Wow. 
Then we had a fight our way up the shores of Lake Garda. We lost a few more men there. And the war ended in Italy in May 2nd. And the, the, the Germans had signed the surrender in April 28th, but still continued to fight for the, that period of time. But then they gave up then. And that ended the war in Italy and in southern Austria. We immediately went through all the German troops. They were still fully armed, but they had signed the armistice, so to speak. This was four or five days before the war ended in Northern Europe. So if they had changed their mind, well, we'd have had a fight on our hands. <laughs> <laughs> but we were only got up to the junction of the Swiss, Austrian, and Italian borders to stop all German troops from getting back into Austria to, to fight against Patton, of course. The third army was up there. And when we arrived up there, at the Pass of the Race, it was called, uh, the Germans saw us coming and they, they turned their guns on us, were about ready to shoot. We, uh, our, our battalion commander was in charge of our, our group, I guess, and he said, everybody turn on the lights of the vehicles. And then when they turned on the lights, the Germans thought, well, something strange going on here. So they waited until we got up there and we, we talked to them. They told them about the armistice, told them they were involved because it involved troops up there as well as in southern Austria. And they said, okay, we're glad to quit. <laughs> oh, wow. And, they, uh, yeah. and uh, that was the end of the war in Italy. <laughs> wow. And after that, we stayed up there for about a week and having a great time skiing. We found the warehouses full of skis. <laughs> and, uh, but then to our surprise, they pulled us back down and sent us over to the Julian Alps over near the U.S. Slav border. Tito was ready to take over that part of Italy. And we decided that the, our high command decided that they couldn't do that. So we were up there and faced them for a couple of weeks and they finally pulled back on, on, onto their border and, and then that's a tryst and all that beautiful part of mm -hmm. Italy. And then, yeah, more mountaineering, more skiing, <laughs> and it's really an ups. <laughs> huh. For two or three weeks, and then they pulled us out and said, you're going to Japan to fight. Oh, really? Okay. And that, that lowered our morale. <laughs> sure, sure. We thought, how are we going to survive that? Now, I don't think many of us thought we'd survive. We know how, uh, how rough the fight, well, it was rough everywhere, but how vicious the fighting was over in the Pacific. Did you guys back then know what, what I mean, I guess a broader question is: as you guys were moving and uh, you're in the, up, up in the mountains and in the forest, were you getting news about news from home, news how the war was going, baseball scores? I mean, were you getting outside news? I mean, did you know how the war was going over in, in the Pacific? Known something because we knew, how, we knew things are pretty bad over there, but I don't remember too much about that about getting news. And what about uh, what about communications from home as far as mail and such? Uh, we have mail, the emails they call uh -huh. it that time. But yeah. uh, being constantly on the move and really in no lo certain location, with mail, were you, did mail catch up to you? Were, it always uh, caught up to us, yeah. yeah. Sooner or later, if we were in a, in a static position at any time, we always got mail. Always, yeah. and, and how about as far as keeping in touch with your brother? Were you able to talk direct, or did, was it via your mom sending? I or, never got in touch with my brother. And not even before I left the United States, if I mean, because he was overseas then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we were in the field most of the time. Right. Never, never had a chance to get a letter there. So, but I did learn before we left Italy that he had been killed. Oh, he was killed over. Oh, jeez. Yeah, he, he had been a. They had been a, a bombing run over Kiel, Germany. They lost their B twenty four. They lost um, one motor then, I guess. And, they started back and they lost another motor. They could have gone to Sweden and been, you know, had to stay there the rest of the war. Right. They decided to make it because there's only two engines. But over the North Sea, they lost the third engine, so they had a ditch. And my brother and the tail gunner were the only ones lost yeah, in the ditching. Oh. So, rough way to go. Oh, boy. Yeah. And it must have been extremely rough on your on your mom, oh, losing boy. your brother and, and you. And, you know, yeah. in harm's way, probably censored, so she really didn't know truly where you were at. I mean, did she ever talk about what she was going through once she got back home and were safe? Did she ever? For some reason, there wasn't much talking when I got home. I yeah. don't know why. Yeah. They thought maybe I didn't want to talk or something. But, mm. but it, it hit her very hard, yeah. yeah. Mm. And she came very close to losing me. <laughs> yeah. It's been half a dozen times. I left, 
just like that. I went through combat without a scratch. Is that right? Yeah. Harold got wounded the first in Belvedere right away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Huh. Do you remember uh, then when uh, you guys heard about VE Day, that the war was over? Was was there celebration? Oh, I mean, God. That, they uh, pulled us out of the Julian Alps. And our divisional commander, General Hayes, decided, well, I'm not going to send you guys over to, directly to Japan. I'm going to get you sent back to the United States for more training. So if that saved us from going through the Suez Canal and straight to Japan, we wouldn't have had the fight, of course, when we got there, because the war would have been over. Yeah. But uh, on the way back, just before, a day or two before entering Newport News again, we got the news of the atomic bomb, and the troops had exploded with cheers. Oh, wow. Because <laughs> we knew we weren't going to be leaving the yeah. United States. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Did so you have any sort of concept what the atomic bomb was and what it was doing? I mean, it just... Never heard a thing about it. Yeah. Nobody did. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody did. Yeah. We heard there was such a thing, and it, it was devastating. So we were home on furlough for about a month, and they reassembled us all out of Fort Carson, Colorado, because of Camp Hill was torn down, of course. Then almost immediately they started to <coughs> send men home with, with uh, nine points, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I had 50 points, about the lowest rank, so I had to wait until December, I guess, to get my discharge. And I did. And I was right back into Penn State. Uh, this is December of. Se 45? December 45, okay. yeah, I've discharged. Now I'm back in Penn State this spring semester. Oh, good, yeah. okay. Yeah. And continued on with your... Uh, on with my education. Yeah. With, uh, in forestry? Uh, I, I finished forestry at Penn State and decided it really wasn't the trees I wanted to grow. <laughs> I wanted to study the wildlife in the forest, so I switched to zoology and biology at that time. Okay. Took my master's at the University of Wyoming, doctor at the University of Colorado. Oh, okay. In, in biology, yeah. And taught for 19 years, I guess, at the university. At uh, University of Colorado? <laughs> no, uh, at the Tutton Four Universities, actually. I, I taught there as a teaching fellow while I was working for my doctorate. But then uh, I went to Mankato State University, State College for my first assignment. I didn't like that, so I quit. <laughs> Went back to the Park Service where I worked for the seasonal naturalist. And ended up in Steamboat Springs at Colorado Alpine College there for six years. And that finally failed financially. Then finally I ended up in Michigan Technological University in Upper Peninsula, Michigan for 10 years. That's where I finished. So you're, you're, uh, you, what did you get your PhD in then? Uh... The PhD was at Animal Behavior and Ecology. It's studying animals in the, in the wild, so to speak. You know a little animal known as a pika here? The, no, that's, that was my doctoral dissertation. Is that right? Yeah. 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 And this all, this all centers back to... Uh, there he is. <laughs> this all centers... Goes way back to your youth and love for the, uh, the outdoors. Is how it... Uh, yeah. 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 I've had four Arctic and sub-Arctic research expeditions. Yeah, talk a little bit about, uh, about those. That... Uh, after I finished my master's, I, uh, I applied for a summer research position on the Pribilof Islands in the Bering Sea, studying fur seal research. So I was there for the entire summer. It was very nice. We were studying out the reproductive cycle of the cow fur seal. I don't know if you have any details on that or not. That's not, not, not too important. That, that was fun. Then the next one. Th Well, before that, there was a, a minor expedition in uh, Labrador Ecological Studies. I assisted a man from McGill University in Montreal in his doctoral research. That was before the Pribilofs. And anyway, after the Pribilofs, uh, Dr. Olis Murray, who was a very famous naturalist, and his wife wanted me to join their expedition to the Brooks Range of Alaska. And then that was in 1956. And uh, I joined that. We were responsible for creating the Arctic National Wildlife Wow, yeah. wow. Yeah, and that, that was wonderful. Huh. In 57, I went back to the Fish and Wildlife Service and out to, to the Western Lucians, to the island of Amchitka, to study sea otters, some research on them. That was the island where the Atomic Energy Commission exploded a couple of atomic bombs. Oh, really? And, I didn't know that. Yeah. They, Fish and Wildlife Service prote protested, but they literally told us, shut up, we're going to do this. And they, and they, they killed a lot of otters. <laughs> mm. uh, anyway, 
those were my four Arctic expeditions, and that was fun. I, I imagine, uh, obviously, you had the, the knowledge, but uh, your, your 10th Mountain training play, we played in very well. Yeah, it was a, well. a good combination, it sounds like. Uh, Absolutely. Between, yeah. The 10th Mountain Division did an awful lot for me. They were my lifestyle, my friends, everything I did from then on. Hmm. And that was true of, most of many of the men in the 10th. We, mm -hmm. we were really lovers of mountains at the end. <laughs> there I am still at 8,200 feet. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So I, I take it through the years, then you've you've kept in touch with guys from the mountain, Tenth uh, Mountain, and Some, yeah. gone to reunions and such. Uh, We've had many reunions in Italy. Italy, I, I've been on two of them. They've been in many as twelve or fourteen, I guess. Uh, every summer they go back. Is that right? Yeah. And the mountain people just love to see them. Because we liberated them. And yeah, right. They're, they're right. Happening, so, yes, yeah. Yes. We don't have any anymore, I guess. It's our last national reunion was a year or two ago in, in Denver. That, that was the end of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yes, we, we do correspond. Mm -hmm. Harold and I are still pretty close friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Through the years, uh, I guess, well, I guess the question I always like to ask as we get towards the end of this interview, these interviews, is how do you think, uh, and you've kind of talked about it a little bit, alluded to it a little bit, how do you think your military experience affected your life, changed your life, played a part in your life? Uh, or was it just a, simply a chapter in your life? How, how, would you, how would you answer that question? Well, my, my greatest interest in, in biology was mountain ecology and the behavior of animals in the mountains uh, and the Arctic, too. So, so I would say it definitely funneled me into the, in the sort of research that I did. And my general lifestyle has been a follow-up of what I began there. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I skied for years until my, my back went bad. And my, Did that knee uh, ever give you any trouble? Knee never gave me much trouble. No. Hmm. Uh, I had a hip replacement. Once I got the hip replacement, I decided I better not ski anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I had to quit. <laughs> but I still, still live in the mountains, near the mountains. And sure, yeah. That means an awful lot, yeah. yeah. But this, to answer your question, the Tenth Mountain Division channeled me in, into my way of life afterwards. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, as we get we're getting towards the, the, the tail end of this interview, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about, or any stories or thoughts pop up in your head as we've been talking here that you want to dis discuss further? Uh, hopefully, so we can round out your story and cover pretty much as all of it as we can. Um, uh, Harold Hagen was instrumental in introducing me to Dr. Murray and his wife up in the Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And there again, that, that meant an awful lot to me from what happened afterwards. Career-wise, yeah. I, I became practically a member of their family as far as that's concerned. Is that right? Marty Murray referred to me as her third son. So I, I knew them for pretty well even before the 1956 Brooks Range expedition. And Olus Murray was responsible for me getting the, the position on, on the Pueblo of Islands because he was so well known in Alaska. Also for, responsible for my assignment to the Sea Otter Project. And of course, the, the Bookshrine's expedition in 1956 that led to the Arctic Refuge. So somehow the military ties in. The, yeah, right. Yeah. Because of the men I met there. And, uh, yeah. And I, I noticed in, in doing a little research on you that you actually wrote a book about your experience in the tenth. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. It is. It's entitled the The Journal of a U.S. Army Mountain Trooper in World War II. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't decide to write that until long after the war. But what what prompted you to to, to write it? No, I started it early, about right after the war, and for some reason I, I didn't feel like I was too enthused about it yet. Maybe because of memories or something, I'm, sure, not, yeah. I'm not quite sure. But, but then later on, I, uh, I, I just sat down and started it. I didn't attempt to write, write, a, write a book, but yeah. I finally I did, did, did the whole thing, and friends read it, and they said, Bob, you ought to have this published. So, so it was published. Uh, Self-published. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. And that was the, 
That was the first one. And he was, these are my four expeditions in the north. The Four Seasons North. That's in the Labrador, the Purple Ops, Brooks Ranch, and the Sea Otter Project, and Amtrak, and the Lucians. Wow. Huh. So the tenth led the both of them. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, uh, like I said, we'll, we'll start to wind down this interview. Uh, anything else you'd like to talk about uh, that we hadn't covered? Uh, I can't think of anything. I, I, it, is, it was a very short interview for uh, someone that's had such an incredible uh, uh, life experience. I hope that we've uh, covered your stories to your satisfaction in that regard. But uh, Yeah, that's about as much as I can think of at this moment. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, Bob, I want to I wanna thank you for sitting down to, to tell your story today. But more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you very much. It was great.